Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us at the front line this evening. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Mark Manet Brown, who is the Foreign Office Minister responsible for Africa, Asia, and the United Nations. Um, I think more importantly than that, though, Mark is, uh, uh, I would argue, you know, one of the the diplomats, most experienced diplomats that we have in this country. Uh, he has a career spent in foreign policy. Uh, he began life, unfortunately for him, as a journalist, but uh, he went on to greater things afterwards, um, uh, notably uh, working for the United Nations uh, uh, High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, working also at the, um, at the World Bank, uh, setting up an international consultancy public relations company, um, and um, eventually running the UN uh, Development Program, which is the UN's chief uh, development agency. Um, he uh, was Kofi Annan's deputy at the United Nations, uh, where he made a name for himself by taking on um, the neocons, uh, particularly John Bolton, the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, uh, who was rather dismissive of, of Mark, and uh, Mark gave as good as he took, I think. Um, and uh, a year ago, he was a surprise appointment uh, by Gordon Brown and his new intake of ministers uh, to take up the essentially the number two job at the Foreign Office. Um, now I think um, many of you will agree that it's a particularly good moment to um, ask Mark some questions about um, <laughs> the big issues facing us. Mark I know is, has been intimately connected with um, events in Zimbabwe and building up a coalition to <laughs> put pressure on Robert Mugabe to cut the deal which was announced this week. We'll have to wait and see if it works. Um, he's just got back from Nigeria. He's just finished a, a book on his um, experience of, as he puts it, a, sort of a personal experience of globalization, but his, his work around the world. Um, we have the United Nations General Assembly opening next week, where I'm told Sarah Palin is going to make her debut on the international stage. Uh, but uh, we will also have um, the Iranian president present, and George Bush will be making his last speech. So, uh, very much a, a, an eventful um, occasion, and uh, Mark will be there for that as well. So, you may like to ask him about that. And of course, he's also got Afghanistan on his plate, which is uh, something I know that is of huge concern to many people in this country. So, uh, without uh, any more ado, I'd like to turn it over to Mark to. Uh, make some introductory remarks, and then we can have some questions. Thank you. Well, Richard, thanks. And I, I will be brief, because I think the, the value of this, from by all accounts, is the chance to, 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 to have the conversation and hear the issues that you think we should be ab addressing better and trying to give you good answers. Um, you know, I, I, um, I, let me start by just making some contrasts between you know, a life spent in multilateralism versus uh, now suddenly being back uh, in, in British national uh, foreign policy. And, and, and in a way, it's a sort of, I was saying to Richard before we came up here, it's a sort of confirmation in some senses of what you hope is the case if you're a multilateralist, but fear may not be, uh, which is that there is you know, a growing international uh, set of diplomatic structures which you have to participate in if you want to get together a policy to deal with Zimbabwe or Pakistan or Darfur or Afghanistan. And uh, the idea that there is just still an independent British foreign policy which wags its finger at Mugabe or says to Pakistan, you've got to return to democracy, uh, or tells Sudan that if they don't kind of let up on the killings in Darfur, uh, there are going to be consequences. Uh, you, you very, very quickly realize that, of course, the, the British threat alone uh, doesn't, even in countries where we you know, are still regarded as a very important embassy, which is all those countries I've mentioned, uh, it still doesn't carry the day. And you know, British diplomacy, as I see it, uh, is an automatic process of instinctive triangulation today. We have a problem in Zimbabwe. How do we make sure Brussels is on side? How do we pull Washington into the same position? How do we work the African Union to make sure they're on side? How do we come to terms with the fact that if an important regional neighbor like South Africa isn't where we are, it's a kind of veto on what we want to do? 
uh, because its influence is so much greater than ours because of its proximity, uh, because of its historic, political, cultural uh, links. And so, you know, in a way, British foreign policy is today a lesson in modesty. Um, it's a recognition that you've got to work with others uh, to get things done. Now, for me, that's fine, because that's been my whole career, uh, sitting at the center of one of those webs, the UN, and, 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 and trying to sort of pull things together into kind of workable coalitions of, uh, uh, around a sort of progressive agenda of trying to stop a, a Darfur or uh, trying to find a solution in Zimbabwe. But it's very nice, if you like, to come out to the periphery, not a term that Britain or London is used to being described as, uh, and realize that it really is the case looked at from this end of the telescope, too, uh, that British foreign policy you know, really does require uh, that we work with partners on pretty much everything. Um, and. You know, so that, so that, if I made that observation one uh, about uh, about the sort of contrast of you know, if you like, of a multilateralist homecoming. Uh, the second one is, you know, I, I before any of you say it, got myself into quite a lot of trouble early on um, by some some what were seen here as loose statements, and you know, I reflected on it because actually you don't get to the top of the UN without kind of knowing how to kind of you know balance. <laughs> verbally and rhetorically on the end of a pin and stay upright because you've got you know on almost anything you say particularly if you're trying to push you know some progressive hard edge points of view uh, in in policy making you've got kind of 192 countries to kind of skirt around and work with and make sure that you don't kind of you know touch uh, too many red lines of countries that that, that can block what you want to do so you know, the multilateral diplomat, you know, is quintessentially someone who's learned a certain sort of verbal dexterity. So, you know, I was sort of deeply puzzled at, um, you know, what had happened. Was it too much claret on returning home or too much malt whiskey before interviews? What had, why had I suddenly lost my touch uh, for avoiding um, rows I didn't mean to pick? Can I just say, um, I think you're, you're, yeah. you mean reference to the quote that you said that uh, Bush and Blair would not be attached at the uh, hip. I'm sorry, yes. I, I, uh, this was the, uh, a, ref a reference, obviously, to the, the, the new brown foreign policy outlook, right, right. And, and one which uh, caused in instant criticism, but right. actually proved, I think, to be absolutely right. I mean, we've seen a very different approach from Downing Street since. So. You might say that. Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't possibly use it. I'm learning. I'm, I'm learning. I've at least now got a sort of television drama th series version of how I should behave. Uh, right. But, but, but I think actually there is, you know, behind it lay, you know, actually, you know, a fascinating to me difference in how the two systems of a national political versus a multilateral system work. Precisely because, you know, I mean, I learned at the the, 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 um, at the knee of the, the great multilateralist Kofi Annan, and um, you know, I think you know what I learned from him was you've all the time got to sort of state positions which try and pull people in around what they agree with. You try to kind of avoid as much as possible uh, dwelling on what you disagree with people about, because otherwise you just can't get in a 192 member state system, you just can't drive people forward. Whereas coming back here, I was instantly struck by the fact that, you know, this is all about wedge issues in national politics. You absolutely must never be caught saying something nice about the other side. Uh, you must never um, in any way uh, suggest uh, in a kind of deprecating way that, you know, maybe you don't have all the answers that, um, you know, you want to learn from others. And, you know, you might think, well, what does this example of saying that, um, you know, Bush and Brown wouldn't be joined at the hip uh, refer to in that sense? Well, you know, it was actually part of a kind of classic, if you like, UN answer to this. It was to first acknowledge things would be different and, you know, what what, what I'd in fact said was that, you know, these two previous leaders, Blair and Bush, you know, had gone through a war together and a war which was highly controversial and unpopular and it had built emotional links between the two of them which you could never expect 
a new British Prime Minister to emulate. Uh, but that that didn't mean you wouldn't find lots of kind of national interest issues which would kind of keep the relationship, you know, pretty much on track so that the fundamentals of it would remain untouched. And was I, what I wasn't ready for was the way a British political system reads that statement versus a multilateralist one. The multilateralist one would say, clever acknowledgement, things are different, but the important point is he's saying they're still going to be partners. A British system reads it as, ah, picking a fight. Uh, and, you know, in a sense, national politics is based around picking a fight. And so, you know, it, 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 it and, and I don't say that with any, you know, I mean, with, 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 any, with any complaint because, you know, I, I quickly remembered where I was. And, you know, I, I had at an earlier stage of my life advised a lot of political candidates around the world. So I understood all about picking a fight and about wedge issues. But it, 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 it is you know, a very, very different culture in which you, you, you try to work things through. And so to my kind of third and final introductory point, which is, you know, and, you know all of you as students of, of, of the tension between foreign policy and national politics won't be surprised by this. You know, I do feel in an extreme way, though, this issue between, you know, the realities of foreign policy are going out there and triangulating and finding common positions with allies uh, and trying not to pick fights but get as many and broader coalition of people on side as possible, whereas the requirement of domestic political politics is to pick fights and take extreme positions. So, you know, I'm very struck on the way, whether it is how to deal with Georgia and Ukraine uh, or on so many other issues, this fundamental tension between, you know, the fact that if we want an effective policy on Georgia, we've got to kind of bring some of the slower coaches with us. Uh, we've got to at least keep all of Europe with us, but we've got to keep the immediate region with us. And that may require you know, a somewhat more, uh, if you like, conditioned uh, policy of engagement with Georgia and Ukraine than, you know, what the British public and the British press wanted in the middle of August, uh, which was instant action, condemnation from London, uh, you know, an absolute strategy to make sure Russia would live to regret this. And, and while I think it's extremely important that Russia does live to regret this and recognizes that this kind of action, you know, is not, uh, is not acceptable, uh, you know, I, f I, I feel we always have to kind of, in a sense, you know, as, as diplomats, try and manage this double chessboard, we've, or at least we've got one chessboard where what do you do to get France and Germany on side and uh, how do you keep the US with you and not let it get too far out of head, ahead so that you know, it finds itself out there without allies? Um, you know, how do you manage these, 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 these very different reactions within different parts of Europe? Uh, you've got to manage that whole complicated chessboard with, if you like, the simpler kind of drafts board of the domestic reaction, which is people want tough words, firm statements. They want, you know, the Russian bear to kind of be shoved back into its stable and the door locked and its meat taken away. And, you know, I, I, as I say, I mean, this is as old as foreign policy. I mean, Palmerston and Gladstone and others were always struggling about how to balance, you know, the, 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 the kind of internal demand for action against the limitations of even in those days of, of gunships and expeditionary forces. Uh, and when the British voice really did count uh, alone in the world. Uh, so it, it's nothing new, but I suppose for myself, given this particular you know, internationalist background, it's fascinating to, to watch the interplay uh, between the domestic political requirement and uh, the, 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 the sort of international options that are actually really available to one. So let me... Fantastic. Well, there. thank you very much for that. Um, lots of interesting subjects that I'm sure we'll, we'll pick over. Um, can I just make one request that um, when you ask a question, if you can keep it to a question rather than a statement, because we're really here to listen to Mark, and try and limit it to one question. If we have time at the end, I'll try and get back to you for a second one. Yes, who'd like to ask the first question? Sir.
I've, I've worked closely with diplomats for the last 15 years, and I've noticed that although at the very top they are you know, very <coughs> exceptional, um, they're not so exceptional a little lower down the heap. Um, <laughs> Is, uh, I've also noticed that the funding for the Foreign Office is continually being cut. Mm. And this tension that you refer to between the multilateralist approach and this need to do something instantly, is that actually um, saying that the Foreign Office is not held in particularly high regard by the Prime Minister, um, certainly the press and others, and is that what is leading to this cut in funding? And if you continually cut the funding, where, do, where does that put the Foreign Office? I think it's a really good question. Um, let, let me just make one contextual point. Having lived and worked in Washington, um, you know, and as having seen foreign offices in many other countries around the world, uh, because in my UN days, you know, our, our official first sort of partner ministry in different countries was usually the foreign ministry. I don't know a country in the world where foreign offices are taken as seriously as they think they should be. You know, in every system, they're kind of down the political pecking order. And also, really peculiarly, and I've never come up with a good reason why this is, foreign offices and state departments, which are in general, if they're good, and there are lots of ones that are, and I'll argue in a moment the British is one of them, um, you know, are so astute and clever about other people's politics but blundering asses when it comes to their own. Um, and so, you know, the State Department can never get its way in Washington. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, I, in many other countries, you know, the foreign minister is a kind of lightweight who's brushed aside by the president and, you know, just, just not taken seriously. So, you know, it, it, it's a global phenomenon. Now, whether or not global integration and the fact that you know, everything is getting so globalized in terms of solutions will strengthen foreign offices around the world. I, 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 I hope, but I'm not sure. Um, because, you know, what's an interesting trend also is at the very time that foreign offices are facing weakness and actually also budget cuts. I mean, talk to the French uh, or, or talk to the Americans about their budget and they're going through similar difficulties. Um, but, you know, what's happened is at the same time in all those all these countries, domestic departments have created their own mini foreign offices. Um, so, you know, I used to struggle mightily at the UN on global health issues where, you know, global health was dealt with by the US out of its Department of Health, uh, which happened to have a very pro-life component in it of, of people, which therefore meant that, you know, family planning, reproductive health, HIV AIDS issues were, were not being dealt with by diplomats who understood where the rest of the world was on these issues, but, you know, a group of people who had a particularly narrow agenda of their own. And, you know, if you look today at a British embassy exactly like a French one or an American one or a German one or even, you know, increasingly a Brazilian or Indian one, you know, in the apparent diplomatic establishment in that embassy will be at least half a dozen other domestic British departments represented with their staff there. So, you know, you could well imagine a global sort of system being managed by home offices talking to home offices on migration issues or policing issues and, uh, and environment ministries talking to each other about global warming. So it won't necessarily revive foreign offices. Now, you know, the second thing which is also true, you can imagine that, you know, poor old French diplomats have exactly this same sort of reputation as, you know, being slightly effete and overpaid and, you know, preoccupying themselves at cocktail parties that the British Foreign Office has, 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 has struggled with. And, you know, even the poor State Department, which can only serve you know, rather bad Californian wine from the bottom end of the price scale is also, you know, vilified in Washington, you know, as a bunch of people who, you know, because they've all went to Harvard and aren't, you know, real Americans. So it, 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 it's, a, it, it's a sort of widespread um, phenomenon. Um, but, I mean, coming from that to the specifics of the British situation, you know, I think there has been much too much cut 
in the budget of the Foreign Office because, um, you know, I, I'm and, and you know, I think it has been driven by the fact that you know the Foreign Office has a kind of bad public image. You know, it's people think it's these vast embassies and you know lots of sort of diplomats. You know, when in fact it's straining to keep up with an ever more kind of complex workload. Uh, and, and I think, you know, I actually have great hopes for David Miliband being able to reverse that. I mean, we came in just as the current three-year spending plan was finished and it was too late for David to, to turn that round. But, you know, if he remains Foreign Secretary for long enough, um, I would hope that, and they're three-year spending rounds, so don't read anything into that. Um, um, you know, we have two more years to go. But um, if, if um, you know, I think he is the kind of uh, minister who will have a great success in, in sort of getting back the, the, the spending. As to the quality of the diplomats, I actually, you know, I mean, it, it's certainly the case that diplomats don't feel as well paid as they did. And, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not doing this very well. Um, I may need help, sorry. Um, but actually, you know, I'm, I'm very impressed. I mean, you know, in, uh, there were fantastic, brilliant people in the UN who never get the credit they should. But it was a kind of uneven bureaucracy where, you know, you were never quite sure things were going to get done. Some things were done brilliantly, some things were dropped. Whereas, you know, actually I'm, you know, what impressed, and, and, and the most, the biggest flaw in the UN was, you know, we'd constantly be finding that someone had talked to somebody and forgotten to tell the rest of us. You know, there was no culture of kind of note taking and reporting. You know, I can barely talk to my wife without a private secretary saying, you know, what did you tell her? Uh, we need to note it out to uh, um, a dozen embassies. So there's a very, you know, there are some real strengths, a great culture of information sharing, tremendous reporting skills. When I come back from trips, you know, and I read the, the cables on, on what we'd achieved in the trips, I think, God, like it the hell, was it that good? <laughs> but, you know, um, so, you know, it's still got a lot of strength, but it, it, it's frankly getting cut to the bone, and that's got to change. Yes, sir. Kavi, Lord Malik Brown, do you see any prospects of uh, this hangover, that uh, empirical hangover that foreign, F, foreign office seems to be afflicted with coming to an end. I ask this in all seriousness because uh, during the last few weeks, the role that the foreign office has played in, the, uh, uh, in ensuring that uh, Asif Ali Zardari who has never had a democratic mandate in Pakistan has been uh, that he gets to the presidency. And particularly, uh, I think more than one visit that the former uh, UK High Commissioner made in this regard, which has been very seriously commented upon in the Pakistani press. So this, do you see any prospect of this hangover that we still are the empire on which the sun never sets and that we can uh, do all over the world uh, as we would like them to do our bidding? Well, well, actually, and take this in the spirit in which it's meant, your question was kindly and, and gently asked, so let me respond in kind and say I'm not sure who's got the hangover. Um, <laughs> because, you know, I, I, I'm well aware that, you know, our former High Commissioner went and his trip was in, cast in exactly those terms, to which, frankly, my answer is, I wish. Um, because, you know, I don't, you know, going back to what I said at the beginning, you know, I would take Pakistan as a classic case of, you know, where we are not as influential as, you know, we are reported to be, either in the Pakistani media or in the UK media. Uh, we can move things in Pakistan. The rest of Europe looks to us as the most knowledgeable European uh, embassy or high commissioner in our case there. So, you know, we can kind of be very influential in where Europe is. Uh, but, you know, we, 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 we kind of find ourselves with the US needing to stay on the same page as the US if 
Pakistan is to take us seriously because the US you know is frankly many times more influential given its military aid program there given many other things and you know if I go back you know when I joined the government last year you know President Basharraf was still very much in office, and we went through the process of the declaration of emergency, uh, the elections, the tragic assassination of Benazir Bhutto, uh, then all that's happened since then. And, you know, it's a classic case of where we had a single strong view, which I would say is not, I hope not an imperial view, which is the sooner Pakistan could be returned to a democratic resolution of this political confrontation in the country, the better, and that the role of outsiders was to kind of push that forward. It was not to kind of predetermine who should win. Now, you know, it's an open secret that others who I have mentioned, you know, were very wary about <coughs> certain of the potential candidates to lead the country, you know, feeling that, you know, they didn't, you know, they weren't necessarily good Democrats, had too strong Islamic connections or whatever. You know, and our view was, look, you know, our influence can only go towards trying to ensure free and fair elections, and then Pakistan's on its own. <laughs> you know, it's got to live with the choices of that, but we've got to help them find a way out of this cul-de-sac of a military government uh, whose best years are behind it and who doesn't have any exit strategy of its own. Uh, and so. You know, that was our role, was to make sure there was a democratic transition and that that continued. And obviously the issue of President Musharraf stepping down, uh, trying not to have a, a clash that might have undermined this new democracy through an impeachment hearing and him staying on, all of these have been critical to moving that democratic process forward. But I want to be very clear, not in the election itself and certainly not now, in the selection of a president, uh, did the British have a horse in this race? It was an effort to try and ensure as fair a process as possible. And le let me just say, the as possible is a key conditional term, because you cannot take a country under the stresses and strains Pakistan is, both its political, economic, and social systems, uh, come out of a decade of military rule and expect an impeccable democratic outcome, particularly when the most popular politician in the country has been assassinated in the middle of the race. So, you know, I mean, it's, it, it, it's a messy business, but for us, the only issue is to keep moving it in a democratic direction where Pakistanis make these choices for themselves. It sounds from what you're saying uh, in your opening remarks and to some of the questions as though Britain has a far, more, a far less assertive foreign policy than we had under Tony Blair when, of course, we were involved in, I think, five different uh, foreign wars and we felt very much that, um, that we in the United States could dictate foreign policy around the world. Would that be fair to say that, that we think we're, we carry less weight now than we did, say, five years ago? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I. Um, continue to believe that that you know obviously the you know the, an, a consequence of the events in 2003 and the difficulties over Iraq you know very much damaged that particular axis of uh, liberal interventionism and you know a, a, a kind of if you like binary foreign policy system where those two countries we two countries were working you know you know, closely together, and of course it's a pity because uh, some of the earlier actions, such as Sierra Leone, you know, much more modest in a way in scope, had been great successes. Um, you know, Iraq, you know, re you know, was an unfortunate, you know, kind of overreach or whatever else it was because it kind of, you know, made that particular U.S.-U.K. partnership a lot more controversial wherever it was. But you know, I would argue that. You know, even in its heyday, uh, where it had played a leadership role, it worked only when it carried the rest of the multilateral system with it, both in terms of legitimacy and backup. You know, Sierra Leone uh, was a short-term intervention to stand up a UN peacekeeping force, which took over. Liberia was the Americans barely coming ashore uh, from an aircraft carrier while there was an international deployment. Uh, Balkans, the same thing. You know, Kosovo was not an American-British 
enterprise. It was you know, a broader one mm -hmm. where Britain was key in driving Europe. So you know, I believe even then, although you know, Blair was a brilliant sort of, if you like, salesman for this, you know, I always felt he was much more of a multilateralist than was seen because he so brilliantly managed that nexus between, you know, bilateral Gladstonian, you know, language of gunships and expeditionary forces um, to satisfy the domestic demand, while internationally, actually, you know, being a multilateralist. So I, I you know, I think I think he did a fantastic job till he spectacularly fell off. You know, the high wire um, in, in, in 2003. Um, and, you know, I'm a great admirer of him for what he did. But as for now, um, you know, I, I think in a way, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's as much time and circumstances as anything else. I mean, I think we, you know, have played influential roles in Pakistan, Zimbabwe, uh, Kenya, uh, to name three. Uh, we've done it in circumstances where there was never any question of, you know, deploying peacekeepers, British, American, or, inter or UN, but where it was, of, if you like, more of a kind of discrete diplomatic task of, of, of trying to push forward a more democratic um, outcome. And I think we've been very active, uh, but it called for a different style, partly because of what had happened in Iraq but also because when you're dealing with diplomacy rather than deploying peacekeepers, you know, you must be more discreet uh, to be effective. You can't be out there appearing to kind of, you know, order people around. Um, and, you know, I also think that some of the things that Gordon Brown has chosen to lead on, like the Millennium Development Goals, where he's got a huge event with 90 world leaders in New York next week with the UN Secretary General, are hugely, hugely important but they're very much at the kind of, you know, the, 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 the sort of non-emergency end of the news spectrum. Mm. Uh, they matter in the long term, but they have difficulty commanding headlines today. Thank you. Uh, lady over there. Can we turn to Zimbabwe? How do you rate now Tabo and Becky's role in the sort of, not quite sure how to describe it, um, but the fragile, shall we say, um, agreement that there is now in Zimbabwe? And would your answer be different if you weren't um, a UK minister? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's a mixed thing. I mean, as I said in um, my introduction, you know, one of the sort of lessons that Britain has had to learn about Zimbabwe is there cannot be a solution without South Africa. Um, it is just much more there and, and relevant and important to a solution uh, than we are. And, and so, you know, in that sense, you can't work around South Africa, even if you disagree with some of the, the sort of tenets of its position. Uh, you, you, you've got to accept it. And, you know, I, I in a, uh, happened to um, have, have a long conversation with, with Sven Garai about 10 days before he did this deal. And, you know, I, I mean, you know, my position with him was at that point, look, you know, we, all of Europe and the US and many in Africa will support you if you decide you cannot do a deal because it's so flawed and leaves you in such a vulnerable position vis-a-vis -vis Mugabe that you're going to get eaten up. But, you know, we are going to defer to you to judge, you know, what, what, what's the sort of line in the sand for that deal and whether you feel you can get over it or not. Uh, and if you decide you can, we're going to support you because, and, and, and try and help you make a success of it. But the one thing I do want to disabuse you of was my other point in this conversation was that there is somehow an alternative to a South African-led mediation at this stage. You know, there was hopes that somehow it could be taken away from South Africa and given to the AU or to the UN or to some kind of group of African states who represented perhaps a more balanced view than many felt Thabo and Becky reached. And, you know, I felt I'd made extensive 
soundings in the UN and at the AU and with African states. And while many of them were deeply, deeply critical of Mbeki's diplomacy, nobody felt they could push him aside. For two reasons, really. I mean, one, just the, the prominence of South Africa in any solution, you know, as the major economic partner of Zimbabwe's. Nobody understood how you could arrive, or nobody in Africa understood how you could arrive at a solution by taking South Africa away from the table. Second, um, you know, there was just a very, if you like, African reluctance to challenge the continent's first or second most powerful leader and tell him his negotiation skills weren't wanted anymore. So, you know, while there was a lot of grumbling about how it was done, there was a feeling, you know, he had to be allowed to do it. Now, you know, honestly, uh, we wish there'd been a much clearer deal much sooner, which had reflected the March election result. It became very hard to achieve the, you know, the un, sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the unqualified accession to power of Svengarai once there wasn't a second round. I mean, you know, we could go on insisting that the only legitimate round was the first one, um, and that Morgan had clearly won that, even if he'd not crossed the constitutional requirement of 50 percent. But you were always going to get South Africa and many other African countries who would say, look, you can complain that it was the second round was unfair, uh, that there was electoral, electoral excesses and abuses. They tend to say on the side, but remember, many fewer people died in Zimbabwe in that second round uh, than died uh, in the first post-apartheid election in South Africa, in uh, Natal and KwaZulu. Um, and where were your complaints then, kind of thing. But, you know, so you, you, you got a lot of that, but behind it ultimately lay that very constitutionalist position of many African leaders, which is if we don't hold on to our constitution and its provisions, we're all going to be at sea and our borders are going to dissolve and, you know, this whole fragile framework of states we have will collapse. So we have to follow constitutional process. And whatever the means he used, he, Mugabe, is the president. He was the only candidate in the second round. So, you know, we were up against just, you know, peop you know a, a totally different view of the situation to that we held. And, you know, in a situation where we didn't hold all the cards and where we, we therefore had to allow a negotiated outcome to come. But, you know, this is, as I think many people in Zimbabwe have said, not the end or even probably the beginning of the end. Um, it's going to be a long, hard march now uh, for Svengarai to be able to consolidate his position, to take the incredibly difficult steps he'll have to take to end hyperinflation. Uh, and, and to, um, you know, move the country forward to a post-Mugabe era. And, you know, the, the unpalatable truth, but the reality is we will need to work very closely with South Africa to ensure that outcome. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mark, a question about development. Do you think history will judge that new Labour's uh, hiving off of international into a separate department from the Foreign Office was a brilliant wheeze or actually looked at historically a bit of a mistake. I'm asking you as a Minister for Africa because, you know, one, we've now had, what, is it, how many years of, 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 a, of a separate different? Ten, ten. ten years of different. Yeah. And we're in a position to judge. And on Africa, it seems to me that a lot of difference programs lack the kind of political intelligence with which you know so an aid approach to africa isn't 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 working mm -hmm. and um i know and now this is a difficult question because um uh, i don't want to get you in hot but you're with your background in the world bank and the undp you must have a, a view about really whether this kind of separation there are pros and cons, let's put it that way. Yeah, I, th I think that, Paddy, is the word. There are pros and cons because, you know, actually, if you go back 10 years to the political environment where DFID was created, you know, I, and I suspect you at the time, you know, were unqualified supporters of it because, you know, we had a situation at the end of 
uh, the Tory period, where you know, very deep, there'd been a series of excellent development ministers, you know, Linda Chalker, Chris Patton, a bunch of really good people. But nevertheless, uh, Britain's development program had gotten ensnared on lots of sort of aid for arms deal issues, you know, some wacky dam in Malaysia or something. You all remember it better than I do because I wasn't here at the time. But, you know, there was that awful sort of you know, convergence and muddling of political objectives and arms sales objectives with the aid program. And, you know, there was a real, and, and, and you know, if you t take the historic sweep of this, up until the end of the Cold War in 1989, that was the justification for aid programs. Us sort of bleeding heart liberals, Oxfam and the rest of us, made another argument, but the reason you know, you got a lot of aid out of Britain or the US was broadly to support our geostrategic political objectives in the Cold War. And then, you know, suddenly Cold War ends, defense budgets, you know, you think there's going to kind of be a peace dividend, defense budgets are going to come down and development budgets go up because now you can do development for its own sake. And actually, in the early 90s, the opposite happened. The defense budgets briefly went down and then started to grow again. And development budgets plummeted once that sort of geopolitical carpet had been pulled out from underneath. And there was a scramble, not just here in Britain, but for me, running an organization like UNDP or being a senior official at the World Bank, to kind of rebuild these institutions as transparent, anti-poverty organizations that could show how every dollar they received was doing something to reduce poverty. And it was a, actually a survival strategy. We had to delink ourselves from all this sort of murky Cold War politics. I mean, this was a world where we had to explain why there was a huge World Bank loan book to um, Mobutu in Zaire or, or uh, to Mengistu in Ethiopia or to some very un or, or to Suharto in, in Indonesia, you know, corrupt rulers who put a ton of the money into Swiss banks, you know, and it had had zero, actually Indonesia is different, but at least in the African cases, had zero development effect. So across the whole development community, separate, de-link it from a political agenda, link it to a development results agenda and the fight against poverty was absolutely, I think, the right way to go. And to go back to the question about imperialism and the British sun setting, to me, it was also actually part of the answer to that. You had to have aid programs in Africa or in Pakistan, which weren't tools of the High Commissioner's political agenda there, but which won Britain back a reputation for a disinterested moral commitment to poverty reduction for its own sake. So I think all of it is extremely good. Um, but I think, as you said, there are pros and cons. And, and I think, you know, the two cons are, one, you know, we have to find a way in Africa of putting foreign policy back into our relationships in Africa. It cannot be a development relationship. Because, you know, that in itself actually carries its own sort of patronizing tone. Um, you know, it goes back to the whole sort of Ethiopian famine image of, you know, Africa needing, you know, being kind of holding out the begging bowl, which just doesn't do justice to one of our major energy and natural resource partners, uh, one of our major sources of migration, legal and illegal, uh, and a huge foreign policy challenge for us. So we have to balance in a better way our development and foreign policy. And I, you know, I, I like to say now that you know, what I am trying to do at the Foreign Office is bring back a foreign policy for Africa. Because um, I think that's a mark of respect to where our relationships across Africa have arrived at now. It's too important to be just a development relationship. But I think it gains from you know, a little bit of, kind of a, some kind of Chinese wall between the two. The problem of the Chinese wall, however, comes in places like Darfur or Afghanistan in the kind of failed state kind of environment where, you know, it's not, I mean, you've got to have a joined up strategy. In the case of Afghanistan, Ministry of Defense 
Foreign Office and DFID. Uh, in the case of, 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 of Darfur, at least Foreign Office and DFID. And, you know, we now have an international, I mean, DFID was set up with its whole act of parliament, which gives it constant, you know, sort of sovereignty and independence as great almost as though it was a country. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, it, you've got to kind of find a way of joining up these efforts strategically much more effectively in some of these tricky post-conflict failed state contexts than we are presently doing. Do you think then that if it ought to be brought back formally into some sort of, because of course the ODA, which was the precursor to DFID, was actually a, a department inside the Foreign Office, wasn't it? I mean, yeah. it got its budget. Would you like to see DFID reintegrated in no, some Richard, form? I, mean, I, I think the pros of independence outweigh the cons, but I think we've just got to keep its independence but find you know better ways of you know getting the two departments to work together. I mean, I'm, you know, it's a general Whitehall. View. I mean, I'm thrilled. I always thought when I was at the UN and I spend my time trying to get different bits of the UN to work together and I thought, you know, this sort of chronic disease of departmentalitis and silos was, was a UN problem, more fool me. I see it, you know, as true of Whitehall as anywhere. So, uh, but it's, it's changing. I mean, if you look at something like, if you take Zimbabwe during this phase of trying to get a settlement, you know, we've been in the lead, but every meeting I have on Zimbabwe, DFID are at the table because, you know, food aid and all the rest has been so critical to how we've sought to handle it. But as we move into the economic reconstruction phase and trying to help them stabilize the hyperinflation, you know, actually, you will see a bigger and bigger DFID role and relatively a bit less from me, although there will remain a huge foreign policy role. And, you know, I kind of you know, know the people at DFID as well as I do my own colleagues in the Foreign Office and, you know, kind of just think automatically in linking development and foreign policy in a way, you know, at the, the sort of implementation level. And I think we've just, you know, in that sense, we've all got to kind of learn that habit of work, but not through bringing it formally back into the Foreign Office. Okay. Yes. Um, in your diplomatic career, um, representing your head of the state and um, um, playing by the rules of the British foreign policy, have you ever found yourself in a situation when you strongly disagreed with something you had to implement professionally, but disagreed with individually, as an individual, and how did you handle that? Well, you know, if, if, if you kind of rise to the heights of the UN, you find that every day. Um, <laughs> because, you know, obviously, um, you know, there are a lot of policy problems uh, at the UN where you, you know, you think, God, how on earth, how did we get into this corner? But I think, you know, what you also, you know, what I also learned at the UN was that, you know, if you can just continuously remind people of the principles of the Charter and the other legal instruments which frame the way the UN is meant to find solutions. Um, it's not that you actually suddenly find yourself in a situation where you're asked to condone um, mass human rights abuses or allow a war to happen that shouldn't. It's more that you're frustrated that you are sometimes muzzled from being more outspoken in pushing for what you think is the right policy. And, you know, I find the same now back in, 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 in national policy. I mean, there are certainly one or two issues where, you know, left to my own druthers, if I was in charge of that particular issue in the foreign policy or certainly other areas too, one would want to do it differently. But, you know, a Labour government, you know, believe it or not, does still have a sort of certain set of values and organizing principles. So, you know, we're not going to suddenly become big arms sellers or nuclear weapons proliferators or, you know, buddies with, with Iran in its nuclear program. So, you know, there are a whole lot of the sort of things which, you know, one might profoundly disagree with, which are ruled out. So, yeah, I mean, you don't, you know, in, it's like in any walk of life. You don't win all the fights. You don't get your way on everything. Uh, but you kind of keep your spirits up by winning enough of them. You wanted an example, though, didn't you? I think. Yeah. Well, okay. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I suppose a, you know, a very good example, in a way, is Darfur. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I throughout my years at the UN, you know, struggled very, very hard to get 
the international community more seized by Darfur and used to get enormously frustrated that about at six monthly intervals um, some Western leaders would suddenly kind of be the subject of you know a major letter writing campaign or organizing effort in their own countries and would you know stride up to a microphone somewhere and say those damn Sudanese don't stop you know we're gonna go in there and st stop it ourselves kind of thing and you know so British well, not British so much as Western policy, let me put it that way, not British particularly, but Western policy would, would you know, prevaricate between long periods of ignoring it and then sudden short bursts of empty threats, which the Sudanese were never, knew were never going to carry through. And then you had groups like China, which forever, you know, kind of tried to block action in the council and many African countries that also sought to pretend that this was a matter for Sudan to solve. So, you know, someone like myself believing that the UN carried a doctrine of what is now called responsibility to protect would be enormously frustrated that one couldn't kind of gird the international community into you know, a more effective, coherent strategy with a real political will behind it. And you know, to be honest, I'm still frustrated today. It's not, you know, I mean, we do a lot on Darfur from the UK, but you know, we, 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 it's tough to move international opinion on this. Uh, gentleman over there. Good evening. Um, you, you say you've been developing African policy in the Foreign Office, and you've mentioned China. Um, China seems to be moving in a big way into Africa. And how do you feel that Africa will be maybe in 10 years' time if they carry on responding to China as they are, so the no-strings-attached policy that China are giving them? No democracy, money, no aid. Mm. Well, you know, it, it, it's, you know, in a way, as an old development guy, I mean, you know, I have to say the West, you know, left the, left the opening for China to come in. Um, you know, I would, for years, warn Western donors that this very admirable focus on health and education and good governance uh, was going to kind of be insufficient that an Africa that didn't have roads and ports and telecommunications and which was nevertheless told to compete in the global economy was going to cast around for other sources of finance if we wouldn't do it. And we had this kind of combination of a lack of confidence in, in, in the project management capacities of the African governments, the history of some sort of white elephant infrastructure projects in the past, uh, uh, NGOs sort of wanting money to go on the social loans much more than the, this infrastructure for a long time. A whole kind of set of conspiracy of reasons almost, although not a deliberate conspiracy, which meant that, you know, Africa couldn't find money to build out its infrastructure. Uh, and, you know, so the Chinese have, you know, come driving in around that opportunity. Um, but, you know, I have to tell you, I mean, they get a mixed reception. Um, uh, it, it's, it's not straightforward. In many places, they're seen as not actually having no strings attached. They have a very old-fashioned string. Uh, it's a loan. Um, and so for countries, you know, worried about their indebtedness, just having worked their way out from under debt before, there is a caution about it. In other countries, Zambia, for example, there is a strong strain of anti-Chinese sentiment because the Chinese have foolishly brought in too many Chinese workers for their projects, not therefore creating you know, the jobs that, that there might be. But the Chinese being the Chinese, they're quickly learning. And you know, to me, one of the most impressive statistics is the World Bank, you know, which has gone back into infrastructure now uh, in, 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 in Africa. But because its standards are very much shaped by its Western shareholders, it has very high environmental and social impact studies for its projects. You've kind of got to make sure that you, know, you do nothing which is going to leave a lasting damage to to, to, to the environmental ecosystems through which your road or whatever is moving. The president of the World Bank, when he was in London recently, Bob Zelik, observed that more than 70% of the, 
of bank projects which are bid out in infrastructure in Africa are now won by Chinese companies mm -hmm. because they are meeting those standards of environmental and social conditionality and turning in a project at a lower cost and a higher standard than their competitors. So, you know, I think one's got to be very kind of careful about this and just one extra layer to it, which is that, um, you know, I, I mean, it's the sort of broader economic impact. I mean, I think that, you know, the bad news is that, you know, finally, after poorly conceived uh, Western uh, efforts to liberalize African markets in ways that destroyed domestic textile and garment manufacturing and other uh, small-scale industry in many African countries. It was just about recovering and then along comes the invasion of cheap Chinese consumer goods. And so you're seeing, you know, an awful lot of the early growth of small and medium-sized industry gotten whacked on its head again. Last time it was the World Bank and the IMF, you know, with that right liberalization, they just recovered from that, and along comes Chinese capitalism to whack them over the head again. So and that's a downside. The, the other upside, though, is that why are they buying all these goods? Because the Chinese are moving out across Africa, going up the rivers, up the railheads, and opening town stores very similar to what they did in Southeast Asia almost 100 years ago, which, if you look at the economic development of Southeast Asia, was critical in growing capitalist activity in rural and small urban areas in the Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia. So I, I think, you know, one, one shouldn't be too kind of quick to say it's all bad or all good. It's a very mixed picture. Now, how are we dealing with it by trying to engage with the Chinese get them to accept our standards of development assistance, participate in the development assistance committee of OECD, cut out these loans and go to grant-based um, uh, support, and, and generally trying to kind of make them a donor partner rather than a competitor. But, you know, I'm not naive enough to believe that that's going to happen overnight. You know, there is a scramble to control African energy resources underway, and that is going to drive a lot of both development assistance by many countries, but certainly a political and foreign policy towards the region by everybody in the coming years. Uh, yes, lady, thanks to the last question. I was just interested in your views on health, perhaps particularly related to the Millennium Development Goals. And if we were to take a snapshot of world affairs today, what, what makes you feel optimistic and perhaps also what makes you feel pessimistic about achieving them? Well, you know, I, I think health is an extraordinary example of where leadership and commitment at different levels of global society can actually turn something around over a quite short period of time. You know, and you know, and when I say it's at all levels, I really mean that because, you know, when I first as a young journalist started writing about health, you know, there had just been this whole push away from sophisticated uh, hospital and doctor delivery and in developing countries and terms like barefoot doctors and trained healthcare workers who d could deliver, you know, public health systems which would deal with 80% of the kind of easily dealt with illnesses in regions such as Africa or the poorer parts of Asia. You know, it was very much the vogue going back to, uh, you know, the early 80s. And then you saw an extraordinary individual like Jim Grant, the head of UNICEF, come in and wave around in front of journalists like me a little 10 cent, you know, sachet, which was the salts he thought should be given to children who, who got diarrhea after they were born because it would rehydrate them. And for me, as someone writing about development, this was the biggest piece of BS I'd ever heard. You know, surely uh, childhood uh, infant mortality rates were going to be driven by a much broader set of changes. Surely you had to clean up water supply train mothers how to really kind of provide sanitary conditions for their children, you know, I, I, lift incomes, all the rest of it. This was nonsense. Well, those damn sachets, you know, transformed, transformed infant mortality. 
you know, across much of the developing world. And then we saw, you know, a remarkable woman, the former uh, Norwegian Prime Minister Gro Harlem Brundtland, become Director General of the World Health Organization, herself a doctor. She took health from where it was knocking around as an underfunded subject, you know, and put it on the global front line. And then, you know, you saw people like Tony Blair and Gordon Brown here, um, but many others in other countries too, you know, take this up. Kushner, the French foreign minister, is a former doctor and the founder of MSF, and Stoltenberg, the current. Norwegian Prime Minister hugely keen on this. But so if you've got all that kind of leadership at one at, at the sort of international level, you've also seen all of the sort of typical fallacies, the same kind of fallacy that I had when I looked at this sachet, brought to bear on the treatment solutions. You know, huge skepticism about malaria nets. You know, this is nonsense. You can't just give out malaria nets. <laughs> They'll show up on the black market somewhere. They'll you know, people will use them to, you know, to sleep in rather than to sleep under, and um, you know, all sorts of stuff denigrating things about how they wouldn't be properly used. Well, you know, they're getting out there. All sorts of individuals are contributing the ten bucks or whatever it is to buy them, and you know, they're getting out there in their tens or now hundreds of thousands, and. Perhaps the best example of all, HIV AIDS. You know, when I went to UNDP in 1999, annual treatment for someone in the developing world to be put onto antiretrovirals was about $12,000 a year. Today, it is less than $300 a year. And as and that transformation happened because people like Kofi Annan, you know, pushed by the likes of me to do it, and many others with much stronger public health backgrounds than me, you know, bullied, charmed, uh, cajoled the drug companies into allowing ge generic manufacturing, used an apparently completely unrelated thing, a small article in the World Trade Agreement, which was meant to give the right to countries to manufacture certain paint patented materials in a time of war or national emergency where they could no longer import them from their traditional suppliers, used it instead to manufacture AIDS vaccines generically, bypassing the patent rights of Western drug companies in India and Brazil and South Africa and other things. So you had this kind of policy attack, but the most important thing of all was, you know, what happened at the actual community level. Because, you know, as we brought the price down, the argument still was, oh, God, you can't deliver antiretroviral treatment in Africa. You've got to kind of concentrate on prevention. The millions of people who are infected are lost. They're going to die. And we saw extraordinary people challenge that. We saw in Uganda, you know, not always the best organized of countries, you know, anti clinics developed to give out antiretroviral uh, uh, medicines where you have to track that people take it, you know, properly every day and that they come back into the clinic every month so that you can check their levels. I mean, you know much more about this than I do, I suspect. Uh, and, you know, actually, at the big AIDS conference just a month or two ago, one of the news reports I was thrilled to read was that the United States and Europe were now looking to Uganda as to why its antiretroviral treatment rates uh, were holding up much better. Uh, there were fewer people falling off the wagon of treatment than in the US or in Europe. In other words, they've developed systems which are better managed. Uh, in a healthcare s environment where you're spending probably about 50 bucks, 100 bucks a year per capita on healthcare delivery systems, they're delivering treatment more effectively than we are with our hugely expensive things. So, you know, w what you're seeing is this, as I say, from a Kofi Annan or a Gro Harlem Brundtland or a Gordon Brown at one level down to ordinary folks making these health systems work, we are seeing a transformation in the health of the world. Now, there's a long way to go, and lots of countries are still spending dismally small amounts, although health budgets are growing, and we're all trying to find ways of giving better aid in a more kind of useful way and not just building a hospital and forgetting to pay for the doctors or the medicines for it, and you know, giving, if you like, programmatic budget support rather than 
individual project support. So there's a lot to go, and it's one of the big items for next week at this MDG meeting in New York is, you know, this sort of accelerated healthcare delivery thing that Stoltenberg and Brown, you know, actually lead on. Um, but to me, you know, if there's ever anything to inspire me about how, you know, you can take on complex issues and through the right combination of bold public policy and relying on ordinary people to do a lot better at managing resources than the experts think they're going to, uh, you, you can get great world-changing outcomes. This lady at the back here. Yeah. I was very taken with your description of the tension between, I don't know, you've called it bleeding heart liberal multilateralism um, and domestic policy and your experience of it. I'd be very interested in your views um, on how that plays with Afghanistan, because I think that it throws into very sharp relief there, particularly because there's so many British troops there. Yeah. How, how long as a multilateralist do you think those British troops should be there to rescue what is thoroughly a failed state? Yeah. But how long can a British government of whatever colour actually keep, let, let alone the number of troops they've got now, any troops there at all, given the death rate that yeah. we're now seeing? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, you know, I think Afghanistan is a hugely difficult problem. And I, you know, I, I feel a little bad about it, actually, as a UN official, because, you know, I, I, I was actually the first UN guy back in there, senior person back in there after the fall of the Taliban was first into Kabul to kind of organize what was going to be the international relief effort. And we were actually all guilty in the UN. You know, a few years on from 2000, December 2001, when I made that visit, you know, we kind of thought the back of the problem was broken. Um, you know, we thought we were thinking of closing down much of the UN office there, turning it over to being a UNDP-led, tradi more traditional development program. And, you know, we were slow to recognize that, you know, the military political situation, you know, had really fallen away. And I think, you know, in that sense, you know, it's, fast, it's easy to say, well, the U.S. got distracted by Iraq. <coughs> Truth be told, you know, everybody missed this one. And I think, I mean, you know, I'm sure there were, you know, people working on the ground in NGOs who didn't. but. You know, we, we missed a critical couple of years, and the price was, when we came back to it, uh, there was a situation where large parts of the country, or uh, well, the South particularly, was in terrible situation and lost to central government, and, and, and hence this heavy troop deployment. But, you know, I, I'm very, very clear, as are my colleagues, that, you know, there's, there's, there can be no talk of, you know, this being something where we're there you know, some of the terms you sometimes hear in the press are 20 or 30 years. You know, you, you know, every now and again a British official gets quoted like McCain was once quoted on Iraq, you know, 50 years if it takes that or whatever. You know, it is impossible to conceive of, you know, uh, British public opinion supporting or, 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 or indeed being wrong in not supporting um, uh, something much less than that. I mean, there's got to be a period where, you, you know, there is a stabilization effort which is very, very quickly followed by a political reconciliation process, not necessarily with the Taliban itself, um, but with, you know, the groups who support it, the, if you like to use the language of these things, which I'm never very comfortable with, the kind of soft support, needs to be kind of won back uh, through a combination of political reconciliation and development results uh, so that we can get this away from being a militarized problem as quickly as possible because, you know, that is not a viable long-term solution. I completely agree with the implication of your question. Somebody else at the back? Yes, Catherine. Hi there. Um, another question about Afghanistan. Um, it strikes me, I mean, you, you, you describe quite a chaotic situation there uh, at a couple of years lost. Uh, it strikes me that um, you, you've got a coalition of countries who don't always know what the other one's doing. Um, and even within the British contingent, as you rightly said, you've got the military, you've got the Foreign Office, and you've got DFID. Um, I was struck today by the apology that Robert Gates made in Kabul for the civilian casualties. 
Um, as we all know, that's been a, a huge problem recently. It's growing very much worse. Um, the US actually does have a, a fund, as I'm sure you know, uh, to, to compensate civilian casualties, but none of the other countries in NATO do. And it strikes me that that's a rather stark example of um, that kind of lack of coordination between the different countries and the different departments. And there's no reason why they couldn't be uh, that there couldn't be a centralized program for that. Um, and I, I wondered what you thought about that. I mean, for example, if if Britain had been the ones to think up that idea or to be lobbied to do that, would you have had the courage to do it? Uh, would Britain have the courage to do that if America hadn't? Um, so in a sense, what, what you talked about, about this lesson in modesty being part of British foreign policy and understanding, could it also be a retreat from responsibility that, that you're always having to look to your senior partner in a coalition and even then you're not catching up? Well, I, I mean, I hope not. I mean, I think, you know, it, it's, you know there are plenty of uh, situations in the world uh, where, you know, the U.S. is not particularly in the forefront, where it is more of a Europe-led effort or Europe plus Commonwealth-led effort. I mean, many of the development item issues we've just been talking about, for example, the U.S. is not a particularly strong player. Uh, it's not putting up development assistance on the scale relative to its economy that we are uh, putting up. You know, it's skeptical about working through uh, international institutions to solve these things. So, you know, I, I really hope you're not right. I think that, you know, there are many issues on which, you know, we are taking a lead and are well ahead of, 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 of the U.S. But, um, you know, to, and, and we must be. I mean, that's got to be the definition. You know, if we've got to work multilaterally, then we've both got to be leaders. But also, I'd say, sometimes learn from others, too. So, you know, I think actually, um, uh, you know, in, in, in for example, I, I mean, I think it's important to understand with the U.S. military in Afghanistan, there are kind of two structures there, as you probably know well. There is a structure that is working down in Kandahar in the south, you know, which is playing a similar role to, to ourselves uh, in, in Helmand, where it is working with the government as a kind of stabilization force and comes out with it like us within NATO's ISAF structure. There is a second group whose main purpose is to pursue, uh, you know, Al-Qaeda elements. And an awful lot of this sort of civilian casualties have come from the activities of that second group. And something that the Americans themselves have been talking about is to consolidate the command of both groups uh, into a single structure. Uh, and, you know, along the, uh, along the lines of that, you know, try to kind of clean up these issues of, of, of the rules of engagement, etc. Um, you know, in general, I, I actually think, and this is going to sort of sound to some of you perhaps a surprise, but, you know, actually, while there have been these terrible incidents, which are tragic and, you know, will be hugely costly to our objectives. I mean, it just sets back what we want to do when innocent civilians are killed in these kinds of accidents. But actually, the American troops in Afghanistan as a whole, you know, are a very impressive lot. They're doing much longer tours of duty than our troops, are coming back, are picking up language skills, and in general, you know, have a, we've got a lot to learn about them uh, from the way they are operating there. Uh, so I think there is a lot to learn. Whether a fund of this kind is something that we need to learn, I don't know. I mean, I just, to be honest, I'm not familiar with the details. But, you know, I think we will come to a critical point on Afghanistan after the elections. Both presidential candidates in the U.S. are arguing that Afghanistan is being lost because the U.S. is not doing enough. I think it's going to be a real challenge to British leadership to make sure that that American desire to do more in Afghanistan is channeled into a politically driven solution and not to kind of throwing more military at it in a way which, you know, doesn't advance the objectives we have. Um, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Lord Matt Brown, um, there appears to be uh, quite a high correlation between the 
foreign policy of um, the UK government and the American government in relation to Middle East policy. And there's also a perception that the US foreign policy is very much um, influenced by certain lobby groups. Um, just as an open question, do you believe that there are uh, lobby groups that influence the British policy, uh, foreign policy in relation to Middle East? Who are they and what's their influence? Well, you know, I, I, I'm there. Am I, I, I thought you thought that correlation was a sort of a accidental mathematical occurrence when <laughs> uh, two events happen to, to coincide. But I suspect you think there's more to it than that. Um, it is not an accidental correlation. Look, I mean, I'm in a very fortuitous position on this one that I don't handle the Middle East uh, in, 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 in the Foreign Office. So I, I, you know, I've got to almost the last question of the evening before I can employ that great diplomat's <laughs> tactic of saying, not my beat. Could I then maybe broaden out the question, the, are you subject to influence on Afghanistan or Africa or the United States? I mean, are there um, lobby groups that to come and see you and uh, try and um, molds British foreign policy and well Trish my wife sort of got me back off the tube I, I came into the, our house two nights ago looking a little sort of hair up slightly pulled. I said I've just been in the middle of a fight um, because I'd been at a town hall meeting for Sri Lankans uh, to to, uh, to 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 answer their questions on uh, British foreign policy and uh, you know it's a classic case here, and I, I mean, I, I'm not going to completely deduct the question because it's a perfectly valid question, but, you know, we do have here in Britain the phenomenon which has been the case in the U.S., much more of a migrant society than our own, uh, for a very long time of well-organized groups representing communities who are first, second generation or, you know, still at least have long ethnic links, uh, uh, strong ethnic links with, with, with their, um, their home. And, you know, it's not just uh, Israeli groups in the U.S., it's Irish groups. Um, uh, uh, you know, it's a lot of groups who, 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 you know, influence American policy or seek to influence it. And we are seeing the same phenomenon growing up here. You know, and it's fascinating. I mean, if you take Sri Lanka, you know, in Sri Lanka, the Sinhalese majority are obviously much bigger in number than the Tamil minority. Here in the UK, it's the other way around, precisely as a result of the kind of persecution of the Tamils. Huge numbers of them are here in London. And believe me, they are a very angry lot. <laughs> um, and you know, uh, and, and I'd gone to what was billed as a small constituency meeting, and it was a converted cinema with hundreds of people in it and 500 people on the pavement outside. And you know, it came to fisticuffs, not between me and them, but between <laughs> the Sinhalese uh, minority who were there and 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 the large number of of, of, of Tamils. And. Um, so, you know, I think it is a phenomenon, and I think, you know, obviously, you know, it is the case that, that supporters of Israel, but also supporters of the other parties in the Middle East conflict, you know, spend a lot of time trying to make their case uh, in British government. And I think, you know, it's, it's in a way, it's another sort of phenomenon of this whole globalization. I've been talking about multilateralism and all of that, but actually within countries, you know, foreign policy is moving from just being the property of some sort of Mandarin, Oxford-educated class who do it all their lives, um, to the fact it's getting democratized, for better or worse. You know, every country now has stakeholders and constituencies that want a piece of it and want to influence it. And you know, I think we have to be extremely careful, extremely careful to make sure we do not, you know, that we both respond to that, but we don't allow the national interest to be hijacked by particularly vociferous, well-organized communities. Thank you. Sir. <coughs> Thanks. Hi. Hi. I was wondering, do you think we have, just now, the global political processes and institutions to deal with the major problems that, that we face. I mean, we have an infrastructure that's grown over decades, centuries, but um, now our biggest problems are climate change, uh, poverty, 
terrorism, world trade, um, and you know, Kyoto was pretty toothless. Doha has collapsed. The GA commitments towards poverty have come to pretty much nothing. Do you think we even have the capability to address these problems? And if we don't, is there a case for really strengthening global government, supranational government? And if so, how do we do it? Uh, uh, <laughs> I'll recommend an excellent book to you on the subject <laughs> uh, coming out next spring. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I was never ceased to be amazed living in New York and working for the UN that the UN globally uh, the whole system, the UNDPs and World Health Organizations and all the rest of it, had fewer people working for it than New York City government, um, you know, by a considerable factor. And, you know, so there is a disproportionality in that we've never let the international system grow. We've also been extremely reluctant to, to sort of, re, re, you know, relaunch it or re-equip it for new problems such as climate change or migration. Uh, or, you know, you know, even on something like food at the moment, we kind of got it all over the place with vast sort of food aid programs, but much less going on to agricultural research and, you know, sort of the tricks of how to develop a healthy agricultural economy in many poor countries. So the system is very out of kilter. It's, it's, it's sort of locked around old priorities, not new ones, and it's under-resourced and it's understaffed. Um, so I think we do need to do a lot. It is, of course, a huge uphill struggle to build the political case for doing it. And it's, you know, a point I'm very, very, you know, struck actually by, in this regard, the dilemma Gordon Brown faces. Because, you know, after 10 years of being a chancellor during the years he was chancellor, you actually don't have any, in, any national leader I can think of who's kind of better tutored in the internationalization of global problems. But it's, in a small way, part of his difficulty today because, you know, oil prices go up. His solution is an energy summit to try and talk down the oil prices with world energy leaders. Um, there's a food crisis and the things cost more in the supermarket. His solution uh, is to, to try and get a, a world trade deal which liberalizes agricultural prices. They are actually, I would argue, the right public policy responses to the crises, but they absolutely, you know, don't move domestic public opinion because um, people say, you know, that's not going to affect the price at Sainsbury's. That's not going to bring my heating bill down this winter. And actually, go the next step and see him as detached and out of touch. And you know, it was very striking to me. I came back my first weekend back in Britain in government, it was all quite a surprise to me. And I, I was, um, you know, and I sort of go to stay with friends near here, actually pick up their, the paper, newspapers on their doorstep on the Saturday morning, you know, and here's my great friend and new prime minister. Uh, and the first thing they're accusing him on in his first week in office is not having fixed garbage collection in, in, in London. Um, and, you know, I just couldn't quit this. Surely the Prime Minister isn't in charge of, you know, <laughs> rubbish collection in London. Surely that must be Ken Livingstone. <laughs> isn't Gordon Brown meant to be, aren't I meant to be helping him solve these big international problems? And, you know, it goes back to the fact all politics is local ultimately. And um, that's the difficulty. How do you build an international system around with the support of national political leaders who kind of get it, but are then able to translate it into a domestic political narrative that carries support for beginning to pull sovereignty around these tricky things like climate change in a way which means, you know, you've got to get used to decisions happening in a Brussels committee room, not always at Westminster. Yes, sir. Lord Mayor Brown, I would like to go back to Africa, if I may, um, and ask you for your opinion on the recent elections in Angola. What do you think about that and how you see the future of, 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 of it when eventually they would turn into national elections? Well, I mean, mixed. 
um, you know, running up to them, everybody said that for a country which has little experience of running elections, that the preparations were pretty impeccable, that, um, you know, they'd invested a lot as they can afford to in, you know, getting the kind of, if you like, the kind of, the, the machinery of carrying out elections work well. And then, unfortunately, it flopped on the day, and you know the ballot papers weren't where they were supposed to be, and the polling stations weren't open when they were supposed to be, and you know it was a really kind of flawed effort. And it's kind of a little hard to understand what happened because you know they were putting great stock on carrying out an exercise which would have international confidence, uh, apparently you know believing that this was the way to kind of drive better relations with the West and to start to kind of come out of their shell and get more respect for being the oil power they are and significant African country they are. I mean, you know, with Nigeria's uh, difficulties now on oil production in the Delta, you know, I think I'm right in saying Angola has overtaken Nigeria in terms of its per day barrel exports. And uh, so this was part of their coming out and they've, they've botched it badly. Um, and of course, behind it lies the tradition of one-party government and, you know, a very uneasy relationship with UNITA, the main opposition. So I don't know. I mean, I think we've got to keep on encouraging them to continue down this path. But, you know, as somebody who has devoted a huge part of his life to promoting democracy uh, in developing countries as the best way of getting accountable government and the best way of making sure development aid reaches the poor because if the poor have the vote, the rich have to listen to them. You know, as a real champion of all of that, you know, I, I kind of have a sort of worry about where African democracy is going generally, you know, with an awful lot of good form, but not always, you know, and, and with preposterous amounts of money being spent in some countries now on elections at all different kinds of layers, levels of government, but where in reality you still have elected dictatorships in the sense that, you know, there isn't a free press, opposition minority and minority rights are not fully respected, uh, there isn't a kind of culture of political debate and respect for the opposition between elections. And where oppositions themselves are much too quick in some cases to kind of fall back on extra parliamentary methods to kind of kind of push governments aside. So, you know, this you know, we, we become much too fixated on the sort of the act of the election itself rather than on a kind of broader democracy building in Africa and African leaders of apparent I fear have taken the wrong signal from us and have rather gone along too often with that same agenda. Thank you. Was there somebody at the back? Yes. Right. Good, good evening. Um, I, I've been very struck uh, visiting the last few weeks all the coverage of the Kajaki Dam um, in Afghanistan and, and rebuilding that. Um, and I was interested um, for a development um, perspective from you. Um, it, it seems quite extraordinary to me to fight to do aid, um, to have 4,000 troops um, at, at this time getting the turbine down there. Um, I heard at one stage $25,000 was handed to one lot of elders on the road to, to guarantee that through, which surely then guarantees they in future will stop any project to get their suitcase full of cash. Um, that, that once it is, it's now there, it's going to take months, years to get that in, during which stage it will have to be defended. They're going to have to fight to lay the electricity lines. They're going to have to fight to get control of every substation which is controlled by different commanders. Um, I, I'm just very interested if that is the best use of money and um, resources in Afghanistan and what seems to be lacking to me as a, as a national strategic outlook in terms of development. Are we better putting our money and time in terms of development um, into more stable areas or or those or perhaps the neighbouring provinces where, where um, they may be wavering currently? Um, is it creating perverse incentives that those areas that are seen to be most violent uh, will get all this, this money? Well, look, I mean, in terms of the development outcomes in Afghanistan, the figures are often cited uh, of, you know, higher levels of girls in school, of, you know, uh, better health statistics, 
uh, and uh, everything else. You know, most of that is, as you know, coming from progress in other parts of the country. And actually, the development spending in other parts of the country is higher than it is in, in the South because, you know, it's so difficult to do development in the South because of the military situation. So, you know, the South and East are, you know, getting a lot less of a development result than, than elsewhere. In results, maybe not in effort, but in results they, they, that they are. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't know enough about whether or not the solution to electricity in that part of, of Afghanistan is best provided by a hydroelectric scheme of this kind or something else. I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to, I just don't know. Um, but, you know, in terms of why we had to fight to do it, yeah, you're right, it's a grim second best. Um, but what you've got is a situation where, uh, absent a process of political uh, reconciliation, where you know the Taliban confront a situation where people do not want them to be attacking these economic dividends or of 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 of, of, of peace, where people insist leave our dam alone because you know we want power in our homes we want our schools until you've got to a political point position like that where you've got people united behind a development agenda you're forced into this incredibly you know second best solution of you know a military protected development effort but i think the goal which is for people to see that development is possible that if there was peace a lot more could happen to improve their lives is a valid one but you know I come back to my earlier answer which is that you know we don't like the fact that we have to do this with a large troop contingent on the ground we can't wait for the day where that becomes redundant and unnecessary and our role can become that of a traditional development partner um, and you know but we, we've made the commitment because of the circumstances of 9-11 to get Afghanistan to the point where it can take control of its own security and uh, development. And as I say, I mean, I, I think we'll just be pushing to get to that transition point as quickly as we can because this is not a good place to be in. Yes, then there you Hello. Um, a question on Africa. Um, I was just wondering, how would you assess or rate, um, evaluate the importance of gender inequality and the treatment of, of women? Um, and I, I guess I'm particularly thinking about um, uh, uh, circumcision and the, the, this very brutal a uh, handicap that, that is created in their lives. How general do you think it is? Is this a particular focus for intervention or an area where change is, thought, is sought? Well, I mean, on the narrow but vital point and, you know, a hugely, uh, I mean, tragic issue of female circumcision, you know, an awful lot has been done, not just by governments such as the UK, but by an awful lot of local and international civil society groups to kind of, you know, build awareness of the real harm the practice does and uh, to kind of, you know, persuade people to change it. And there is, you know, I think there's quite a lot of uh, success and, you know, I, I, I think, the pra I mean, others I suspect in this audience know the numbers better than I do, but I think it's, you know, I, I think the battle is slowly being won on that. Uh, but the broader point of gender inequality, I mean, Africa is an odd place in this regard because, you know, I always say that if you actually were to, to sort of calculate the role of women in the economy of Africa, it's actually much higher than in many parts of the world because of the dominance of both the agricultural sector, which features so largely uh, in Africans' overall GDP, and the dominance in the sort of market women of Africa, in, in, in the retail, the informal retail sector. So, you know, you might guess, and this is a back of the envelope calculation, that women control 60% maybe of the economy of Africa, uh, which, you know, was not the case for women as they sought to win political rights here. 
Um, and so, you know, there's, a, there's an interesting situation, I think, because, you know, there is now some quite striking progress in some institutions, some parliaments, uh, certainly the Pan-African Parliament of the AU, which, you know, has a quite high level of, 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 of women in it. Um, and you're starting to see women coming through, you know, quite interestingly in, in, in government as well. So, you know, I, I hope that we're going to see a real, real change and that there's enough of a kind of momentum behind women's economic and social role in Africa that they can carry it through to the political realm in the coming years. I'm aware that we're slightly running out of time, but I, I had a, an email from a gentleman who couldn't make it tonight but wanted his question asked anyway. He's called Peter Mozinski. Perhaps he's watching us on the internet. I'd like to ask Lord Malik Brown if he sincerely believes it is a good idea for the UK to lobby against the ICC's, that's the International Criminal Court's, indictment of Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir. Well, I'm very glad to get the question because then I can answer I think it's a very bad idea. Um, you know, the, there was a rather inaccurate press story about this last weekend, um, which actually didn't get our position right at all on this. I mean, for those who are not familiar with the background, um, you know, the, the, ICC, the, the Security Council turned over to the ICC for further investigation a sealed list and, and dossier of some 50 Sudanese names who a Security Council investigation had felt were involved in um, the, the human rights abuses in Darfur. Uh, that list has, isn't, the name's not really known. I mean, it was seen by Kofi Annan as Secretary General. He didn't even show it to me. I'm now relieved he didn't. I was rather curious at the time. But, um, but it, it's turned over, and, you know, there isn't a senior Sudanese official who doesn't fear that his name's on that list. Um, uh, and, you know, it began the ICC, the International Criminal Court, having looked at this under instruction or request from the Security Council, indicted two relatively low-level people. Sudanese government responded by promoting one of them to a cabinet-level job as Minister for Humanitarian Affairs. <laughs> um, and, you know, international community deeply pissed off, but not quite sure what to do about it because, you know, a little bit hostage to Sudan in terms of wanting to see UNAMID, the peacekeeping force, deployed, wanting to see political negotiations between the government. ICC more and more aggravated by, these, by no action on the arrest of these two individuals. So the prosecutor... Um, just in the summer announced that he was now recommending to the judges of the court that they issue an indictment against President Bashir, the head of the country, I mean, the head of state. Now this has, you know, put the fox in the chicken coop big time uh, because, you know, it, 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 it's, I mean, it's obviously got the Sudanese extremely alarmed uh, that, you know, a serving head of state uh, might find that were he to travel to the UN uh, for um, an international meeting, he might kind of get arrested at JFK under an international arrest warrant or, or you know, and in fact, if you look at the Sudanese blogs and other information sources, you see that they're even worried that the UNAMID peacekeepers might suddenly, you know, show up in Khartoum and arrest him were he to be indicted, which is the next step of, of, of this process. So it has created, you know, in Sudan, a lot of fears that it might stop cooperation with the peacekeepers, it might stop progress towards elections and towards a political settlement of Darfur. It has also, um, um, you know, actually, frankly, united a lot of African moderates who, for example, were on our side on Zimbabwe are not on our side on this ICC indictment issue and feel that this is a real intrusion of Western institutions into Africa's affairs where you can start indicting African leaders while in office. Uh, who's next, they think? And it's not that they somehow think that Bashir is not guilty of things, but they could imagine circumstances where, you know, some smooth, well-spoken opposition leader in their own country fooled Westerners into thinking that they were a human rights abuser, right or wrong, and suddenly there was an indictment against them.
I mean, we have the example at the moment of the Rwandans who have not got an ICC indictment against them, but have European arrest warrants issued against various senior members of the current government who we happen to think are not guilty of the crimes for which these warrants have been arrested, but who, whose ability to travel uh, and, you know, is now limited. So there's a huge head of steam building in Africa against this sort of, as they see it, and so also in the Arab League, against a kind of Western justice run riot. So you might argue, well, given all that, then why aren't you in favor of stopping it? Well, we're not because, you know, really for two sets of reasons. One, we are extremely wary of doing anything to interfere with the independence of the ICC. We look at it as one of the most important international inter innovations of recent years. The idea that there is an international court system which holds the strong to account for what they do after they leave the position of absolute power, which has allowed them to abuse their system, citizens. And ending impunity of that kind is for us a major progressive goal of, 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 of policy. But the second reason is more practical that, and I've said this to the Sudanese with whom I try to retain, re keep on an intense diplomatic conversation throughout all the difficulties we encounter there, which is, look, if you showed a willingness to really engage, to deal with these other cases of these two people who've been indicted and are still enjoying senior government jobs, if you really now turned around and helped get UNAMID fully deployed, and if you also engaged in a no-holds-barred effort with the rebel groups to do a peace agreement, then you would face a completely different environment in the Security Council where you know, we might say, well, you've made so much progress, uh, we might delay this Security Council thing because the, all the Security Council can do, it can't cancel indictments, it can only postpone them on the grounds that, you know, at a particular point in time, they might put a spoke in the wheel in a way that stops the broader progress. But what we're not going to do, and having said that to the Sudanese, they say, well, what would we have to do to kind of get you to think that way? I said, I mean, we're not horse trading. There's no bargaining here. Um, you know, you, there are examples of leaders who are facing massive international isolation. I think probably from the Sudanese point of view, the best analogy is Gaddafi in Libya, who did a complete turnaround in terms of what he did with the US, UK and the international community on his weapons program and on a bunch of other things, that allowed the whole relationship to change. If the Sudanese could envisage something as bold and as ambitious as that, then people would look at this indictment in a different light. But you know, we cannot sell out the international court or the international justice system for sort of the equivalent of a mess of pottage or porridge. I mean, we can't do it for just, you know, some nice words about how, um, you know, they will ensure justice is done. There would have to be a fundamental change in how Sudan is addressing these internal issues of justice and politics and peacekeeping, and we've not seen that. Well, thank you very much, Mark. I think um, everyone will agree it's been, been extremely candid with us and uh, riveting uh, tour de force. And um, I'm afraid we've run out of time, but um, thank you very much for coming to us. Yeah.